नमस्कार एंड गुड मॉर्निंग आ स्पेशल गेस्ट श्री के संजय मूर्ति जी सेक्रेटरी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हायर एजुकेशन मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एमिनेंट डिग्नेटरीज ऑन द डे स्पेशल एंड वाइटीज सीनियर ऑफिशियल्स डिस्टिंग्विज डिग्नेटरीज एंड डेलीगेट्स रिस्पेक्टेड मेम्बर्स ऑफ द प्रेस एंड मीडिया लेडीज एंड जेंटमैन अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू डे टू ऑफ द एटीन फिकी हायर एजुकेशन समिट ट्वेंटी a global conference and exhibition on the theme empowering minds driving transformation redefining the future of higher education which is being organized by fiki in support with the ministry of education government of india we would like to begin the proceedings by requesting dr vidya to do the honors of welcoming our special guest with a green certificate ladies and gentlemen the green certificate is a fiki initiative wherein we plant a ticket of six trees for ecotourism in masuri uttarakhand in the name of our special guest these trees will be planted thank you dr vidya for doing the honors we would like to inform you inform you sir we began the day today at 9 am with interactive b2b meetings and now i would like to invite dr vidya to kindly welcome and introduce our special guest thank you very much a very good morning to the honorable uh, keynote speaker for the day uh, shri sanjay murthy ji my co-chair professor savik patacharya uh, august members vice chancellors university leaders sitting here in the audience and we can also see uh, some students in the audience uh, it gives me great pleasure sir to welcome you on behalf of the fiki higher education committee uh, as mentioned by the compare this is the 18th fiki higher education summit and consistently we've been doing these summits over the last 18 years and the policy papers that come out of these summits we submit to your honorable uh, office uh, yesterday we also had a presentation on the fiki uh, ey knowledge report uh, which um, spoke about uh, leapfrogging of indian higher education over the day yesterday we have had excellent sessions uh giving an overview of the challenges of the indian higher education we also meant, uh, had a session on uh, the voice of the global south uh, a session that was a conference or a summit that was organized uh, by the government of india um, uh, early november uh, where uh, discussions uh, took place on the challenges and how india can be a leader of the global south i'm very happy sir today that you have accepted our invitation uh, mr sanjay murthy ji doesn't need any introduction but just for some of the participants from uh, outside india uh, sanjay murthy ji is the secretary of the department of higher education in the ministry of education um, he has had a long standing uh, career uh, with the government he has worked uh, earlier as additional secretary in the union ministry of housing and urban affairs uh, responsible for urban transport delhi development authority and uh, mr murthy has served on various assignments including deputy commissioner of three districts in himachal pradesh handling development revenue administration and other regulatory functions but i must say that he is one of the most approachable secretaries of higher education whenever we ask him for an appointment he readily meets uh, all of us and you know he is very open to new ideas and uh, new discussions under his leadership we all have seen uh, many uh, of the easing out of the so called regulations or the regulatory framework and the new regulation of course that is most welcomed by all of us is on the foreign university campuses in india of course having its uh, very different views from different stakeholders but nevertheless a very bold regulation that will see the indian higher education in a totally new light with these few words sir i welcome you to deliver your keynote address thank you good morning everyone uh, dr vidya and dr sarvik the chair and co-chair of the fiki higher education committee delegates to this uh, summit uh, welcome to all of you uh, first of all i would like to express my gratitude to dr vidya for extending this invitation to me and giving me an opportunity to interact with you on this key topic and theme that has been set forth for this summit i would just like to mention three big 
points or themes uh, in which, uh, through which I would like to highlight the work that we are doing and the collaborations that we have forged and the assistance that we look forward to from all of you. As you know, as Dr. Vidya has just mentioned, there has been a slew of uh, regulatory interventions which try to facilitate greater collaboration amongst institutions with industry and other stakeholders. In that line, we have come out with this national credit framework, the Ni national higher education uh, qualification framework, professor of practice, multiple entry, multiple exit. Now, all these themes are, uh, you know, could have been, uh, they were done in the IITs earlier, but this is a time where we need to percolate this to the other institutions as well. Now with these interventions, there is a lot of effort required from part of the industry and stakeholders to provide that opportunity to the students to which the university system is providing education. As an example, there is always this saying about uh, industry not getting the uh, st uh, employees of their uh, requirements or the skill sets that they are required to have when they join employment. These regulatory frameworks have opened up institutions to think on this line very, very, very in a big way. They have been forced to see and interact with industry to see what type of curriculum alignment has to be done to meet the needs of the industry. I'll just give you two examples, one pertaining to the semiconductor area, where METI, through its industry association, came out with a concrete suggestion as to what is the expectation of the semiconductor industry in the skill sets that are required. Now, this has been translated by AICT in its own curriculum and guidelines to all the engineering colleges. And it has percolated right down to the field level to ensure that the type of skill sets that that industry requires is taught in these colleges. Similarly, the ministry is working with this entire industry pertaining to this energy transition sector. The amount of skill sets that are going to change, whatever upskilling, reskilling, etc., is required in just this one sector is being mapped to ensure that our academia and the institutions plan and design their courses to meet this huge transition that is going to happen going forward. Now, when I've just given these two examples, there are many more. We need to work on each of these sectors to see that we are aligned Students are skilled, people already in the system are upskilled and reskilled to meet these environments of the industry. The regulatory frameworks that I mentioned are playing a role to facilitate these universities to keep pace with this type of a requirement. Now, the integration, how do you map all these things? Ultimately, industry, when it does recruitment, it wants to know whether the student has their skill sets or not. So therefore, this technology platform of ABC, the Academic Bank of Credits that was introduced, proposes to ensure that you map these skill sets, the micro-credentials, the skill sets that these students have acquired during their journey in their education period. Universities are to put those micro-credits or credits in their uh, transcripts when the student has acquired them in association with the industry or uh, having spent time in that industry. Now, I'm sure this is playing a huge role. We've got a large number. I think we've got more than 2.6 crore children registered on that platform who have taken an ABC ID. Now is the time to ensure that the relevant credits appear in those transcripts, credits which have been acquired in association with industrial training, internships, and so on and so forth. So I think this is a major, major role backed by a technology platform wherein we require your active collaboration to ensure that these credits and micro-credentials are 
given to students and then uh, captured in this uh, electronic platform for any recruiter to see uh, going forward about the skill sets of a student. This is one thing on the national credit framework, the higher education qualification framework, playing a part in this role in which we require the industry's collaboration uh, heavily. The other part is on governance in these academic institutions itself. And we have a good platform called the Samarth, which is trying to pave way through a 42-module uh, system. It's an ERP for educational institutions, in which more than 2,700 institutions have already onboarded to provide a greater governance feel for all these higher education institutions and colleges. You know, more than a crore students are already registered through this portal. More than uh, 44 lakh, uh, you know, admissions have been processed through this system. Easing governance structures of these uh, institutions, freeing up their space to do more academic pursuits, leaving administration to the uh, ERP solution to manage and bringing greater transparency and so on and so forth. This I mentioned is summit which is getting rolled out in many of the institutions. We have a goal to see that we cover at least 10,000 going forward in the next one and a half years. Coupled with this Swayam platform wherein we have enabled 40% of these credits to be given in an institution through uh, uh, content that is there on the Swayam platform which is operated by IIT Madras. We have done uh, another additional uh, uh, reform to ensure that industry content also finds place in this platform. So we have signed up with many of the top uh, industry players. It could be Salesforce, Microsoft, IBM, so on and so forth, to name a few in the IT space. Similarly, in the health sector space, tourism space, there is going to be a great push to ensure that their content is also made available on the Swayam platform and the credits that they get come into their uh, transcripts in that university to ensure that uh, skilling aspect is also taken care of. Now, we recently just concluded the G20 um, summit here in New Delhi and in the New Delhi Leaders Declaration, you will be glad to know that uh, these find a key mention there, this both Samarth, the Swayam, and the other ones of the school education like Diksha as digital public infrastructure, which we feel can be leveraged for any of the countries in the global south, as you were just talking yesterday. These are good examples of what uh, the industry sector, uh, education sector has been able to bring forth, and I'm sure Students in our own ecosystem can leverage it uh, to a much more extent. Because just as an example, you see the mapping of students who take this YM portal. Again, it's totally skewed to the south. They have found value in that system. We need to see that this spreads more. We need to see it go to the north. We need to see it go to the east. And see that that rich content is available to students across the country to benefit in their own learning cycle. Now, these, uh, coming back to the G20 thing, one was this digital public infrastructure that I mentioned, and we all have a role to play in furtherance of uh, these instruments to countries in the global south for their benefit. We have uh, ensured that there is a critical paragraph in the Leaders' de Declaration which talks about richer collaboration in research, especially for the SDGs, okay? Now, this has come at a right time. We have appropriate regulations of joint degrees, dual degrees also set forth by the regulator. We are sure that uh, institutions of eminence in the country will collaborate very effectively for appropriate research in furtherance of the SDG goals. And I'm sure students of our uh, country will benefit from these rich collaborations that will take place going forward. And as an additive to that, you might have heard the budget announcement where we talked about three centers of excellence in AI, in the health sector, in the agriculture sector, and in sustainable cities. 
Now, these sectors are going to be funded to the extent of uh, close to 1,000 crores amongst all three of them. There is a absolute focus to see that uh, the lead institutions who come on a challenge mode partner with all tier two, tier three institutions also to develop that entire ecosystem right up to the tier three towns to ensure that these models that develop under AI models for these three sectors percolate there and we be as a leader in the community of nations in, when it comes to AI. So I'm sure these initiatives in the technology platform will also provide an opportunity not only to the academia but to industry to collaborate with us to see that appropriate solutions are made in the furtherance of uh, the applications of AI in achieving our uh, sustainable development goals. Well, these were the platforms that and technology interventions that we were looking at. The third pillar I would just like to focus is on accreditation and rankings and the importance that we have played, uh, laid on ensuring institutions do go through this cycle. You will be glad to know that this has caught on. We have used the help of FIKI to sensitize their membership, to see that they activate, actively participate in the questionnaires that these uh, global ranking uh, institutions circulate. We, ha we have been doing this in the last two years and we have seen a massive 200% increase in the response on their uh, response to the questionnaires that have been circulated. And I'm sure that that has played a key role in facilitating better rankings of our own institutions, placing them in a better pedestal in that groupings. And we have seen a quantum jump, not only in the world rankings, but especially in the Asian rankings of our own institutions. This is heartening, and uh, I, I say that a lot of contribution comes from the active participation of uh, associations like yours to furtherance of that uh, aspect. But on accreditation aspect also, out of this 50,000 large uh, body of institutions we have, we have been able to accredite only 1,000 institutions so far. But this drive, this effort of uh, having uh, all institutions accredited has reached such a pace that we've got six, seven large uh, state governments wholly committed towards accrediting all their institutions across the board. Big states like UP, Assam, JNK, Maharashtra, AP, all have signed MOUs or given commitments for ensuring entire accreditation of all their institutions in a fixed time frame. It's no mean task, but I'm sure there is a big drive now to come into the accreditation process to ensure that you have a certain benchmark of quality, which also the recruiters, the industry also looks at while uh, recruiting for their end. So I'm sure that these three pillars that I've just talked about has a role for all of the stakeholders participating in this uh, summit today. We hope that uh, each of you, by providing in your own way, will facilitate the furtherance and deepening of this thing across institutions across the country, and not just in the Tier uh, 1 cities, but in the Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. For an example, the need for better design thinking and entrepreneurship is a key factor that we realize needs to be percolated to the entire faculty to disseminate to uh, the children in their institutions. So we are coming out with a strategy to see that we have industry professionals mentoring a set of faculty on design thinking and entrepreneurship to see that this entire startup ecosystem the design aspects of our products and our manufacturing life cycle also play a role in uh, the pursuit of excellence that uh, this sector will be trying to achieve. Similarly, the point of uh, ensuring uh, that we get uh, Opportunities to, to the students, we have platforms like the AICT platform of internship. As an example, we have been able to do around 20 lakh internships for these students there. But in a four crore ecosystem, you know, 
20, 30 lakhs is a drop in the ocean. These opportunities come only if industry comes forward to give them those opportunities to do an internship. And here, when I mean to say it's not just a checkbox that we are looking at to be checked by the industry to provide an internship, but to have a meaningful engagement with the student who comes there to interest him into that occupation and into that field. A corroboratory issue is one point needs to be reflected as to the uh, compensation that we try to give to our uh, students in pursuit of any sector. Civil engineering, mechanical engineering seem to be dropping off the chart of our institutions. And we are going to have such a big growth in infrastructure and we don't have students enrolling for this will be a very, very troublesome scenario going forward. So I think it's a role that all of us need to recognize to see that uh, they too are compensated adequately to attract them to such important fields which need to meet the uh, infrastructure requirements of the sector. And I'm sure with the deliberations that uh, you may have uh, today, you will be focusing on this aspect also to see that uh, the needs of the industry are also kept in mind while designing and prioritizing courses uh, going forward. So once again, I give you a uh, thank you for uh, calling me over today and uh, look forward to the recommendations of your summit. We are always there to see how best we can carry forward these things in the implementation of the policies that we have laid out. But I can assure you that, that the National Education Policy 2020 has liberated many of the academic institutions to look beyond what they were doing in the past to discover new avenues and new journey for providing better education to the students of our country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for that insightful and motivating keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, may I once again request Dr. Vidya to kindly do the honors of closing the proceedings of the session. Over to you, ma'am. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, and uh, what a wonderful deliberation that uh, you gave us and a lot of food for thought. I think all that you said, if we can implement it in our uh, higher education institutions, that will certainly support the government. You spoke about the digital infrastructure, uh, like the summer or the Swayam platforms. I know that it is skewed towards the south. And we need more and more northern and even central uh, institutions to use that platform and be a part of uh, providing, uh, you know, our courses, the industry. I was very happy to know that even the industry is now going to be a part of the Swayam platform. That's something which is very heartening. Uh, you also spoke about uh, joint research, and I think that is something that we mentioned, made a mention of it yesterday in uh, one of our uh, talks on Global South, where uh, many a times our joint research is limited to uh, researchers from the north, whereas we share the common problems with the Global South. So can we find good researchers in the Global South? South from Latin America, from Africa, you know, and uh, we connect with them, uh, they will also be benefited. You also spoke about the three centers of excellence, and I think this gives us a lot of food for thought that in our universities where many of us are doing work in AI, can we limit uh, or can we focus our work on healthcare and agriculture and, uh, of course, sustainable cities. Uh, and then you spoke about accreditation and rankings. Yes, this is something that uh, foreign partners are looking at, uh, certainly when they want to collaborate with us, more certainly when they want to set up campuses in collaboration with some of our universities. Uh, this is something that I think we must take it very seriously and not really leave it to government authorities to compel us to go in for accreditation uh, and rankings. And uh, of course, you spoke a lot about opportunities for students. And I think uh, we all believe as teachers that students are in the best era of higher education, sir. With the liberation of a lot of things through the national education policy, we all wish we were students once again sitting in those classrooms, undergoing multidisciplinary education, have such a great mobility through the academic bank of credits, and of course, even mobility globally. Uh, I think, uh, my in my personal opinion, India can be a major, major player in, uh, you know, helping the global south, uh, you know, especially countries from Africa. And I think many of us who don't look at, uh, you know, our partners in the global south 
was must certainly do so with the government of india supporting us in such a big way i think we can do wonders with these few words sir i once again thank you for being here and we close this keynote address session thank you Thank you very much indeed. Once again, I would like to thank Secretary Sir. May I request uh, dignitaries to, to kindly come together for a group photograph. And ladies and gentlemen, requesting everybody to kindly remain seated as we straight away move to the next session, which is panel discussion session four on the topic EdTech revolution in India, driving accessibility, quality, and affordability. May I invite on stage our distinguished moderator for the session, Mr. Hemant Sahal, founder and CEO, DG, formerly called Paul, to grace the stage, inviting our eminent panelists, Mr. Pawan Kumar Sharma, CGM Edsil, Mr. Anish Sri Krishna, CEO Times Pro, Professor Dr. C.G. Prabhu, President Manipal University, Jaipur, and Dr. Guru Swami Ravi Chandran, Provost, Geo Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished moderator for the session, Mr. Hemant, is the founder and CEO of DG, which was formerly called Paul, a Bangalore based SaaS company offering DG Campus an all in one middle first digital campus platform for higher education institutions with a vision to empower educational institutions with comprehensive, secure, reliable, and simple-to-use technology, DG Campus enables efficient administration, enhanced learning, and enrich campus experience for all the stakeholders. Mr. Heyman is a serial entrepreneur, and DG is a second startup after his first venture in the second year of college, 2009, which was showcased as the top 50 student startup in the world at New York Stock Exchange. The same venture also got him inducted in Ashoka Youth Venture Program. He also founded the Indian chapter of Kairos Society, one of the largest networks of student entrepreneurs in the world. He is a member of FIKI's EdTech Task Force, was felicitated with Young Thought Leader Award by Crystal and a medal by the Institution of Engineers. He also received the Distinguished Alumni Award from the Wellover Institute of Technology, along with the Emerging Technology Leader Award at the Second Indian Global Education and Skills Summit. He has given talks at many top events, such as UK, UX India Bangalore, Doing Good, Doing Well Barcelona, and Tech for Society ISB Hyderabad, among many others. And ladies and gentlemen, those words of introduction, may I hand over to our distinguished moderator, Mr. Heman Sahal, to kindly carry forward the proceedings of the session with his opening remarks. And may I remind you, sir, the time duration for the session is one hour. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, a hearty welcome to all of you for the first panel of the day. And we will do our best to make it as uh, knowledge uh, rich and as interactive as possible. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among uh, the distinguished members here on the panel and some of them I have known for a few years and have, uh, played a pivotal role in my journey personally as well. So uh, very excited for this conversation. And the topic is EdTech revolution and we all know today Technology is playing a very magical role in our lives, whether it is transportation, how we even eat food, how we even interact with our loved ones, or even we find our life partners. Technology is really playing a magical role in every single part. Right? And obviously education is a little late to the party, but uh, COVID did play a very positive role in uh, pushing that technology uh, in the institutions and today because a larger audience here is uh, from the higher education fraternity so we'll stick to higher education uh, when we talk about the role of technology. So what we will do today is, uh, uh, to all the panelists my request is that I would request each one of you to share one very specific unique value you think technology can add to the higher education ecosystem but something very very specific and not uh, very broad but very specific and then we are also going to open up to all the audience here if in case anybody has 
a very short, obviously, specific point to share in terms of the value. And we'll see then if we can build a theme around it and then take the conversation further around that theme. So we'll start with you, sir, if we can have you. And also, please, if you can introduce yourself to uh, everyone. Thank you, Hemant, and uh, thank you, Vicky, for uh, having me here in this audience. So I am Guru Swami Ravi Chandran. I am the provost at Geo Institute. Uh, so previously, I was at uh, Caltech for more than 30 years, uh, lastly as the Dean of Engineering and Applied Science Division. Uh, so my perspective would be coming from higher education, you know, engineering, STEM kind of things. Uh, so to specifically to address uh, what uh, our uh, chair post is that uh, you know we have been very good at uh, developing content delivery you know what i mean by that is you can learn any subject you know by watching youtube or other sorts of edtech products uh, what we have not been good at is uh, personalizing this uh, content delivery i think that's a big gap you know why is it a big gap it's uh, you know, because we have to assess where each of the students stands in their understanding and how do we uh, assess that and evaluate and recommend, you know, what the content should be and then provide appropriate content. Especially with the recent development in generative AI and other things, it is not just the students who are currently in the higher education system, but also the people of the, you know, who have graduated and, uh, you know, who need to be upskilled because they don't even know what AI is, like when I went to college, you know, we have been taught in deterministic mathematics, you know, calculus and other things, but statistics was never emphasized, for example. And so, you know, I had to learn uh, things by myself. So I think that's a very important gap, uh, one of the things which is missing. The other thing, a small one which I will recommend is that we are all, again, what I mentioned, that we are all used to deterministic thinking, but I think, you know, we need to be able to think in terms of data, because you know, now computing power is so great that it's not that you need to know essentially algebra and geometry and you know, things like that, but also statistics and probability and statistics. And this is not emphasized. And so this is something if people can teach this kind of things into AI plus X and also to the current generation, which is kind of uh, you know, what I call the Insta Reels generation, so there, you know, you need to be able to make uh, short presentations to introducing the concepts of AI plus X, which anybody could learn. I think those are my initial thoughts. So good morning. Uh, good morning, Hemant, and uh, thank you very much for FIKI to having me here as a part of this panel. Uh, my name is Dr. G.K. Prabhu. I am a president and vice chancellor of Manipal University, Jaipur in Rajasthan. So as you know, uh, Manipal is a big group known for education and health care. And this new university we have started in Jaipur in uh, 2011. We have uh, celebrated our uh, 10th year. Now uh, we have about uh, uh, 14,000 students in the campus. And during Corona, after we got the NAC A+, we also got uh, an online education as a vertical. In the four batches, we have about uh, uh, 50,000 students in this. Now, EdTech, basically, it is an intervention of the technology in the education. Now, to, as per the compliance, to start an online education, we need to have a very strong campus-based education. That means the online education will fly over the strong wings of uh, campus-based education. I'm not talking about too much about the ed tech and the, the technology link because everybody knows it is an affordable, it is an accessible, there is a, a quality that which we can build in terms of content and content management and is delivery. We also have some challenges but what I'm talking, which is a very unique, a same university which has a campus-based and an online education. And the question is how an edtech and online education will help the campus-based education. This is a very interesting thing that which we have. 
many universities may not have this kind of uh, uh, what is an opportunity, but having this online education along with me, al having this an edtech uh, software or other platform with me, how it is will me out. For example, I am an electronics and communication engineer. Especially in the campus-based education, there would be some challenges like, let us say, electromagnetic waves. How these waves will move? It has an electric component, magnetic component, third dimensional. Everything can be explained mathematically, let us say, by Maxwell's equation. But the student have a ultimate number of uh, difficulty in understanding this. Because in the campus-based education, regular program, most of the time, our aim is to concentrate on covering the syllabus. But truly speaking, uncovering the subject, how it can be done. So what we have done, because of this online platform and edtech that we have, some of the component of a regular program, which is very difficult to intervene. So these components are being developed by this edtech and also given to the, the, the campus-based program. Okay, the second part, there are some, let us say, one subject, Mathematics 4, Engineering Mathematics 4. In that, it is a differential equation. Very difficult to understand because we found out that in that particular component, larger students are not in a position to answer correctly. So we have developed a small component of only that in the online education. It does not mean the the students are not, or teachers are not taking the class. But this is an N addition to whatever it is and happening. So the student have an opportunity to learn and observe the component uh, um, multiple times, anytime, anywhere, because of the, the advantages that we have it. The third point is there are some courses which UGC says it is a compulsory, it's a mandatory, like environmental sciences or constitution of law. But very difficult to, to, to get larger, because this is the first year where there is a large number of students. So we develop these courses very interestingly in terms of a good content and content management and its delivery and give it to the campus-based program. We are not violating any kind of a compliance. Because UGC also says that 40% of the content, it can be delivered to the online education. So I'm bringing a unique proposition, as Hemant, my moderator, says, how an online education, how an edtech component can also helpful, useful, and also a meaningful for an online education, uh, sorry, campus-based education, and creates a lot of interest uh, among the students, and it becomes a meaningful engagement for that. I'll stop it here, and depending upon your questions, that would be much interesting things that which we can also do it, apart from editing uh, his own advantages like affordability and other things. But the main challenge is even this uh, experiment is uh, creating that interest and competence among the teachers. That is the one thing that which uh, we are working very hard because these teachers could be very good in PPT or in the blackboard, but now giving that training for an edtech and creating that kind of a content which will be a very interactive, it would be a slightly a difficult challenges. But I think over the years that we will also work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Hemant, and thank you, Fiki, for having me here. Uh, I think I'm the one card-carrying uh, representative of the ad tech uh, industry here, and I think you know uh, it's very, very important for us to understand what access and affordability means in the context of the Indian reality. When we talk about higher education in India, we have a 27% gross enrollment ratio. That's a fact, right now. The pursuit of taking that 27% to 50% is, to my mind, the primary remit of the higher education ecosystem and the edtech industry in specific. As CEO of TimesPro, I have overseen a company which started off as a physical vocational training company with learning centers all over the country in an era when edtech had not yet become a word. To today, us not having a single physical learning center, 
working completely as an online ed tech platform, influencing the lives of thousands of graduates who are looking for their first shot at employment, and also thousands and thousands of working professionals who are looking at furthering their careers, and hundreds of thousands of young individuals who are looking at their first shot at formal higher education. So the size of the pyramid as you go up from the bottom of the pyramid of capable 12th standard pass students who are looking to have a shot at their degree to the working professional who is looking to upskill up himself or herself to the next level is really something that a tech uh, can solve for working alongside the centers of excellence that my co-panelists represent. Now, I have started to evolve my thinking on EdTech as not just a platform, which is a one-to-many platform, but indeed as a force multiplier of the centers of excellence, of the work in research, of the excellence in faculty that exist in these centers of excellence, and being able to provide a proper transition for millions of our core citizens into a becoming productive citizens. Right? So today, when Times Pro talks to the son of an auto rickshaw driver, or when we talk to the daughter of a farmer, who cannot take out those three valuable years to actually put time into a formal higher education degree, and when we tell them that, hey, here's an opportunity for you to learn while you earn for your family, and here's an opportunity for you to then continue to retain the aspiration that you can do more than what your parents and their generations have been doing. I think that's where the excitement of EdTech lies, and I think that's where the large opportunity for EdTech lies. I'll stop here for now. Uh, I think there is a lot more uh, that EdTech does, and I agree with everything that my co-panelists have spoken about in terms of the need for EdTech participation in co-creation, uh, perhaps even in areas of research, but that's perhaps a topic that we'll come back to in circulation. Thank you, Hemant. Uh, good morning to everyone and eminent people sitting out there. I represent EDSIL, uh, which is a public sector unit under Ministry of Education. I am the Chief General Manager handling the digital education perspective. So probably the we are heading towards interesting times and there's a lot of information which is publicly available on EdTech. And all you being the eminent people who are in relationship with the education. So EdTech is not a new thing for you because during the COVID period you have been uh, seeing this that has been that has been a a main thing which has been brought up by everyone to connect with the students when the physical access was limited. So that is, everybody has gone through that. But I think the, the panel which was asked what is the one main challenge which uh, is important to us is what happens, there is a huge amount of content which is available. There are platforms N number of platforms with the YouTube which is available across but it is important that the students who are the end users for them the curated content from these platforms is what they are looking for because if let's say let's say if uh, sir as Prabhu sahab has told that this is a Maxwell equation which has to be understood because these are very difficult subjects which a student has to understand and what is the best video that has to be rated out. So if anybody wants to solve one thing which is an important problem is how to make this curated content available to the universities, standardize that and that's a big opportunity in the edtech space who are, which are the companies working towards that. That is what is an important parameter which I force, which I foresee that is going to change over a period of time and which will be very focused in terms of uh, getting the right 
content to the students to understand that thing that is what one important parameter that we have been also working with the industry leaders how to curate those content and that's what sir has also mentioned that the swam platform and all is the n number of libraries and n number of content which is available but the main focus that we are as a government entity is working towards to bring those content curated content available to the student and i i think if the higher education students you can always see that one of the best platform if you see that nptel i i mean whoever has used it and it's a very simplified way of the videos which are available although these are not uh, these are large videos but it is one of the best platform which can be used by the students for their understanding of the content in higher education however the process which has to be further improved is has to have a curated content to be made available through this platform and that is what we are working as a government entity right now thank you thank you thank you so much to all the uh, panel members who share their views we'll quickly open up and if you can have your thoughts on but again let's be very specific and short if you have again i'll repeat it's a any unique value you think technology can add to higher education we'll quickly take a few thoughts from here and then we'll come back build a theme uh, can we have a mic here please if there is anybody here okay so we'll, i'll i'll repeat it if you can start with sir if you can yeah unfortunately i can be loud enough yeah i can pass my mic otherwise here thank you uh, i i think through the national credit framework uh, which is yet to be implemented but the draft is out there circulated there's a fantastic opportunity not to restrict that tech to he and ve but also move in to ie which is experience because there is cross mobility provided for build up of academic credits even through experience work experience and it is all very well graded in the national credit framework if edtech is avail available and i don't think that this requires universities to look away from it it's not it is not uh, i mean educational institutions are not going to be he alone in future there will be he ve and also the use of you know ie conversions into academic credit and building up of that bank i think it tech has a great opportunity there for the millions of people who could avail of this sure thank you sir anyone else uh, that wants yeah please can you pass the mic to her please yeah there 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 back yes uh, hello everyone uh, my name is prachi i'm the country manager for a uk university called manchester metropolitan uh, it's quite interesting to hear how a lot of us in indian institutions are actually moving towards technology because of course this was something that we all were forced to during covid period i would love to hear all our distinguished panels thoughts on the point that since covid us as an institution at least in the uk when we were experiencing a lot of students are no longer uh, planning to take up programs which are very tech oriented or virtually represented or delivered primarily due to the fact that the practical exposure really uh, goes down at that level so would love to hear your thoughts that how do you think institutions like us or yourselves could actually uh, overcome that hurdle to encourage such students to even enroll to these platforms sure. thank, thank you thank you uh, i think the, the, yes please go ahead yes sir so, so you know two institution one here one you know globally presenced anywhere and together student can benefit from both the institution at one point of time so you know technology has actually increased the reach sure. uh, both uh, you know within india outside india and as well as you know opportunity to interact with uh, subject matter expert irrespective of where they are earlier it was a difficulty of you know traveling to a particular place but now with the setup that we have in our universities i think that something can help students as well as the faculty to collaborate sure. and work together thank you yeah so uh, 
Jai Hind. This is Dr. Tushti from Subhati School of Language and Linguistics. So I have a query with Dr. Prabhu. Uh, I have just heard. Uh, at the moment, we are actually, if there is any unique value you think actually, technology can, let's stick to that and then we'll come to okay, other okay. points later. Okay. Yeah. As we have come across the discussion that 40% of the classes could be run in a flipped room. So uh, being a language linguistic trainer, I would like to know how do we go ahead with language training? Uh, because we feel a uh, dearth of language trainers in a physical mm -hmm. mode. And we want to give a very elite training to our students who are going for international, um, uh, you know, higher education and in their professional prospects. Sure. So could you guide us about Thank that? You. Yeah. Thank can, you. Can we pass the mic? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Raj Tripathi. I represent British Council. I think uh, my uh, comment would be to see, we, we are seeing that, you know, if you have to deliver 80 million students over a year, uh, brick and mortar is not going to be successful. And, and there needs to be a complementarity that technology can bring in. Uh, while we say that uh, technology will be a very important uh, level play, playing field, uh, would you be able to kind of show some thoughts and share some light in terms of how do we see the quality of delivery of the courses that we are looking at? Because um, we have seen that even though there is a SWAM platform and there are technology platforms available, there's always been a, a sentiment that the quality of the conventional education system vis-a-vis -vis the online education system has uh, a different marketability and recognition by the industry. So any thoughts on that? Sure. Thank you. Uh, can we pass the mic here? Yeah, we'll, we'll just cover here and we'll come back. Yes, please. Well, I would like to uh, get introduced this uh, uh, spiritual literacy in the digital age. Yeah. How to really inculcate that because uh, in that spiritual literacy, uh, something wonderful has been done, so I would like to share some of these uh, booklets with you, that how this can go all along, because without knowing your own potential, uh, you, you cannot develop it that way. Sure. So in a nutshell, I would like to say the outer expression of your creative intelligence, which is as soul, is your attention, which is like an omni-scanner. And this attention remains connected to the absolute intelligence capable force that energizes the whole cosmos every moment. So it passes through the mind and then through the body, through the senses, this attention like an omni-scanner goes downwards and outwards into the world. So in spiritual literacy, it is only a point that how to really withdraw this attention to the location within the body to get connected. Because focusing is taking you out into the physical uh, yoga, you can call it, or the focusing can go to the mind, which is known as mental yoga on various issues we can do. And withdrawal of attention is the point where you can connect it to your source within your body. Sure. So yeah. this is what Thanks. I would like that Thanks. spiritual literacy should be sure. added into Perfect. the program. Perfect. Can you. we have your, yeah. Hi, good morning. Raghav Gupta from Kosova. Uh, I came in late, so I don't know if this was already so, asked. So, Raga, what we are asking is like a unique value you think technology can add in higher education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, generative AI is the technology of our times. Um, how is MUJ online, how are times pro thinking about learner value, instructor value with generative AI, if Perfect. at all you're thinking about that? Perfect. I think we will take last two points there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll just quickly come back. Sure. I have two points. One is the how the e-learning um, or online learning will take care of uh, socio-emotional learning. Second point is that the whole global um, higher education uh, system has a two concerns. One is the confirmation of learning, uh, confirmation of learning by the learner. And second thing is that the uh, engaging learner in learning. Yeah. So first point is very sure. well discussed. But the second one is that confirmation Perfect. of learning. For that e-assessment, there are so many tools, but they are not enough to uh, just Perfect. know which I e said. Excellent points. Thank points. you. Thank yeah. you. Myself, please, Professor Sanjeev Sonnawane, Vice Chancellor of Yashantrao Chavan, Maharashtra Open University. Lovely. Excellent points, sir. Can you Professor Pankaj ji? Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Pankaj, and uh, currently I'm with OP Jindal Global University. <clears throat> I'm having a little bad throat. <clears> throat> I've been also Vice Chancellor of many universities earlier. 
see my question is there is no doubt <coughs> about what technology can do regarding the subject which i broadly term as avidya like accounting blockchain big data and those kind of a thing and there also <coughs> i was recently invited by microsoft and we gave some talk there on these future of learning and uh, <coughs> it is all about creating a certain pool from different sources and then churning and rechurning that is ai as per our understanding but then the higher education says that creation of knowledge then storage of knowledge and then the dissemination of knowledge so i am saying that if you are relying too much on the technology related thing then the original thinking which is like you know i don't know that i don't know those kind of domain and the pure innovation will get affected and we are knowing something and that is again we are marketing and branding and rebranding so that will limit our potential as a human being and secondly you know this avidya can very well be taught by technology use platform and we can make it better and further level but the real vidya that who you are like what this gentleman was also sharing i now teach i no longer teach courses on accounting and finance which i was teaching globally many years now i teach courses related to bhagavad gita ancient wisdom i am teaching globally and they are getting so much of importance there so how we can also integrate these kind of courses into the technological thing and also like converting teacher to gurus and those kind of a thing it would be a very important sure thing. sir thank, thank you. you i think we have not taken anything will quickly yeah i i'll repeat it you just share yeah my question is that my name is aapke which professor aapke which and that is that the student out of class okay perfect once Great everything question. is available yeah. when everything is available in google and media then why students should come to the class yeah can we have yeah we have it okay quickly yeah, yeah i am polymi mukherjee from the art of living and i was uh, wondering if you could consider the element of mental and emotional health of the students while considering perfect. the perfect thank you i think thank yeah you. that's a yeah good afternoon see actually my question is can we have a true interactive digital platform for all the stakeholders for the higher education perfect thank you yeah last year I'm Shilpi from UK IBC. Uh, my question, not my question, sorry. My input here is how EdTech can assist education, and I work for uh, a, a global top-ranked university. What I've seen is um, in in the Indian EdChi system, there's a uh, there there is a need for uh, you know online libraries and online journals. Uh, perhaps not as much as uh, say a top ranked institution globally which could assist indian students and also the linking of library systems uh, where uh, i do understand that it could be you know uh, cost intensive to have these uh, strong library systems but if that is something that could be considered uh, by the edtech that will be perfect thanks we will have professor sawik as the final comment before we go back to panel okay so i don't have to introduce you mentioned my name um i'm talking about a, a tech a feature uh, for uh, distance education for science and tech content so i i think uh, one of the questions was related to this that the, the virtual process uh, uh, doesn't offer the the practice part which is true so uh, one institute is doing this for few years maybe 4 5 years 5 years now for uh, education for working professionals i'm talking about remote laboratory it is not i repeat it is not virtual laboratory so you're talking about physical laboratory physical test rigs operated from a distance anytime anywhere by students over iot internet etc it's little expensive but it's the technology is possible i haven't seen any and i don't know many institutes are doing this but this is great experience the student actually will be operating the ring up and and things like that uh, it's it's called remote laboratory by that organization remember this is not virtual laboratory it's a yeah. great uh, you know experience for the student you can't have the student physically in the laboratory but next to that this is the best possible option sure so absolutely sir, i have small point sir i have small yeah. small Uh, in my classes i always come across this uh, is there any uh, google rank type of thing for youtube videos because i don't know which uh, youtube videos are important uh, and which are many are undiscovered so 
Is there any technology platform or which solves this, uh, sure, this thing? Sure. I am Dr. Dhananjay from Narayana Group, sir. Perfect. Thank you. I think we'll have last Rajita ji here. Yeah. Thanks, Hemant. Rajita Kulkarni from Shri Shri University. Um, I, I mean, this is a double-edged sword, but in uh, the COVID time, we learned that how more screen time, more technology meant more isolation, more depression, more anxiety, and more aggression-related issues. So I think as educators, that is a real paradox, I mean, a real dilemma that we are facing, that how do we combine this in a way that leverages the benefits of technology, but also it is, I think, our dharma to protect our students and make sure that these kind of uh, disorders don't, uh, you know, enter their lives at a young age. So this is a challenge, I think, uh, you know, I think we are all seeking solutions sure. to. So that's something to Thank discuss. Thank you. Yeah, so in the interest, I'm very sorry we'll go back to the panel now because we're almost like 35 minutes into the session. But one good thing is, Rajesh, we know the room is awake, right? Everybody is listening to us. So that's the good news, right? So I'm actually reminded, beautiful, I've written every single point that you mentioned. And I'm actually reminded about probably, I think, seven or eight years back, there was a beautiful conversation around the philosophy of education happening at Nimans in Bangalore, which I was a part of. And it talked about a very beautiful model around learning. And it said, at the center of the model is a learner. And what is the most important thing beyond content, uh, teachers, everything else, is the consciousness of the learner. Is the learner conscious enough to know that what he or she wants to learn, why he or she wants to learn, what are the best learning models that works for them. And if the learner is conscious enough, then the learner needs the environment, which requires teachers, resources, uh, you know, uh, and also uh, the inspiration and all the other models. So we'll probably have, to, I'll have two questions for my panelists. And the first question is, how do we really help a learner become conscious? Because I think all the ed tech and technology in the world would be waste until unless that learner is conscious. So we'll again start with you, Professor Ravi, if you can share very specifically, how do we make a learner more conscious? Uh, Heyman, that's a great question. I think probably the question of the day, right? I mean, this is a philosophical question, you know, which goes back maybe thousands of years back. Uh, I think first you have to instill, you know, you have to make them excited about what, whatever, you know, you want them to learn. I think, uh, you know, the, the one thing which I've seen that works is that through example. I mean, you know, the, the way we are taught math, maths, for example, is very dry and abstract. And this same thing holds for AI, and I think somebody mentioned industrial practice. So we have to bring practical examples from the very beginning, you know. And that is also from a multi-dimensional point of view from various disciplines you know, how do you do that? And, you know, again, technology can help here. Uh, you know, there was a very nice article yesterday about using AR, VR, you know, that you can go to Harappa, Mahajadar, you know, things like that, and, you know, visualize what, what is there. And I think that could really make, you know, the inner, inner experience. And I think that's uh, one thing I can think of what tech can do. Yeah. Um, of course, he has... Uh, nicely put it out, the, all the questions uh, together in the one question. So very interesting uh, uh, queries that we have it. Of course, the one thing that we have to be aware that every part or every course or every program, it can't be done uh, through technology alone. That is one thing that we have seen. Of course, during Corona, we were all forced to do that, whether it's right or wrong. But soon after when uh, we are back, as uh, you rightly pointed out, there is a larger interest that they would like to come back to the campus. In my personal opinion, all undergraduate program, it has to be done in the campus based because along with the knowledge which edtech can do much better, there is a lot of other learning outside the classroom, whether it is a networking, emotional, being with the friends. So those things are very, very important in that particular age group. So we must uh, appreciate that, understand it, and do that. Okay. Next one point that I will bring about the quality. Quality does not always mean only for the 
ऑनलाइन कंटेंट क्यूरेशन मैनेजमेंट डिलीवरी द क्वालिटी आल्सो ब्रिंग्स इन द क्लासरूम एंगेजमेंट सो दिस इज सो इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड टुडे आई कीप आस्किंग माय टीचर्स इफ यू हैव डेर इनफ टू से दैट अटेंडेंस इज नॉट कंपलसरी ऑफ कोर्स सो वी एंड इज टीम इन बिट्स हैज डन इट attendance is not compulsory in bits okay but in all other education we are not very confident to tell that by the time that you say the students will not be there in the class what it means it means that we are not bringing that kind of an a very engage uh, content and quality delivered the students are not finding that value for the time and energy they sit in the class so the quality comes there and uh, as the professor mentioned every time it has to be introduced beautifully the introduction of the subject why why i have to learn this what is the application where it will be used and that is the level with which it has to be gained once the student knows that why i am learning this subject or this content then it is up to him and then once that is being done most probably the the teachers hand holding or even in the online education there would be a lot of interactions must happen with the mentors and once it is done the technology can drive it at any level in the name of the content and interactions and all but both physical as well as an online it has to be required and some of these practical experience it can be done much better even in online it is possible but we require that and in 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 our college it could be very waste of time that put all my teachers in content creation no if you do that we are defocusing there are some people are very good in delivery maybe there are some people are very good in content management so i can create a a central content management and verify with the, the same teacher and let him go and deliver it rather than wasting his energy and giving more time uh, on developing the content so even in the administrations we have to be very very clear uh, in what is to be done so that that is where I, i'll stop it here thank you thank you okay. anish no i think the point on uh, consciousness was covered very well by both the by both your previous speakers uh, two anecdotal instances came to my mind and i thought uh, while well, well they may not be directly addressing this uh, but they very interesting use cases uh, one was uh, a personal experience i had uh, with a k12 edtech provider uh, not working for the private sector not working for uh, private school students but working for remote government school students all right uh, now this is a south based experiment and uh, i was invited to to give my views on it the challenge was that students were learning in vernacular and they had to be taught complex concepts of science and math the challenge was that the local teachers were not as good as you would like them to be uh, and the challenge was that the tech in those remote villages was also not as good as you would like them to be so at best you could have a one way we set uh, broadcast and you had to solve for the uh, feedback loop uh, to the teacher and this startup had done it brilliantly and i saw a classroom uh, i saw several classrooms uh, connected via via a system uh, wherein the teaching was by an expert teacher sitting in the capital city of that state talking in the vernacular language of that state and there was a feedback loop which would which would comprise of little you know konmaniga karodpati kind of you know uh, devices where you could just give your responses in a b c d the class was engaged to an extent that i have not seen not just the top of the class but all the way down uh, to the to the back of the class and these responses were available in real time to the teacher uh, to address gaps and to top it all there is a call center that would be able to receive calls to clear doubts of the students over a 2g mobile phone and i thought that was one of the most engaged and conscious classrooms i've seen the second anecdote uh, is about an iim classroom uh, it's a remote iim classroom that times pro runs 
And pre-COVID, uh, I am required that all of these students come to a learning center and take the streaming live video coming in from the IIM campus. That was the model. And IIM figured that there was a benefit to it. There was cohort learning and so on. The moment the lockdown hit, we transferred all of these students to an online learning module. So initially, there was a lot of complaint uh, from the students saying, hey, this is, not, this is not what we signed up for. This is not something that we, that we enjoy, and so on. One year later, when the lockdown opened up, I am naturally required that all of these students come back to the classroom. Uh, the protest was vociferous. Uh, and, you know, the, it was to the extent that we had to call for a meeting of the faculty, the students, all of them to, to try and figure out what the issue is. Point is that change is tough. And when, when there is a change to any new mode of learning, whether tech or not, uh, it has to be managed, it has to be handled very, very carefully. Uh, and and that's, that's really where uh, we are seeing, you know, some of the challenges in EdTech. So I'll stop there. Um, and so I, I think I'll just focus about one of the important point which Hemant has raised is about learner's consciousness. I mean, that's a very important point. I think <clears throat> uh, self-aware. Uh, the, the students who are much more self-aware in terms of how to utilize this edtech world effectively are getting the result out there. That is important, but I, I think how to build that consciousness is very important. It is because it's not only the learner, it is the educator which has to pay a pivotal role out here. The technology is moving very fast, you know. And uh, the, the teacher has to adapt to that and adapt to the pace of the student. I mean, students from the beginning, you know, screen times, whether you want to reduce or not, it, is, it, is a, is a, it, it has come by as a new normal in our life. You know, whether you want to teach or not, people are glued to the mobile phone. People are glued to the screen time. People are connected always. That's, that's what we say that. But it is the educator who has to build that whole ecosystem either in the classroom or it is in the flipped classroom or it can be an online assessment mode, what is called scuffled type of technology where they give the task and increase the increase the complexity of the task to the student. So there are many mod models which have been evolved. And I think that as an educator, you need to choose which model will be appropriate for the student and which will be more effective for that class. Most of the time, what I've seen is that uh, when we do and deploy any projects, I mean, the, the we focus on the capacity building of the teacher as a prime thing. Because that's the way students, they should be able to connect with any technology platform and effectively deliver that as, a, as to the student. So because if you see that as an educator, there are huge tech research which are going, there are models, technology TAM models, technology acceptance models which have evolved and which clearly f work on two factors. I mean, whether technology is... One is perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. I mean, as an educator or as a student, it should be useful to them. And that will build their own uh, consciousness that, okay, this is the content which I have to connect and this will be useful to them. And it is like ease of use and how effectively the technology becomes ease of use for the teachers and that will be, will be able to connect to the students effectively. So this is the ecosystem which is evolving. This is the ecosystem which, which as an educator has to play an important role and has to connect to the student to build that consciousness. Yes, there is huge amount of content, huge amount of uh, good content. And any normal teacher, what I'm talking about, it is not like uh, even an effective teacher. Any normal teacher, if he knows how to use it effectively, he will be the, he'll become a best teacher in that university and he can y deliver a very good outcome 
to the student that's what i can say out here and that is the way i would say that it's not only the learner it is also the educator which has to be important to build the whole consciousness and to make them aware to the students that this is this is the way it's a, it's a, it's the way which you need to effectively choose which videos which topics to understand effectively so that's what i can say that there are n number of examples once we implement onto that but we can explain those things but i see that when we implement this projects from the hsl from the ministry of education we focus on capacity building of the teachers and that is what important point which i wanted to open to everyone uh, for better understanding thank you all right thanks i think we have last 10 minutes left so i'll have a one specific question to each one of you so anish uh, a lot of times the act, as an ed tech player your mandate is to most of the time get a job to like get them skilled so that they land up in a job and there's so much of discussion around spirituality and the mental health how do you when the mandate from the learner who's writing the check or making the payment is get me a job how do you then imbibe spirituality and that into the you know the models that ed tech has right so how do you mix the, how do you bring that flavor into your ma mandate so that's a that's an excellent question and it will probably require the better part of a couple of hours for me to get into it uh but if you if you look at uh what we are trying to do uh on ed tech platforms uh, especially on live uh, taught uh, ed tech courses uh you're trying to replicate a guru shishya parampara that we have in this country and in that parampara the guru is actually taking on the mental not just of the teacher but is also taking on the emotional mental of keeping that student in a good balanced sense all the way from the classroom to the interview room and to later in life so this is something that we focus on especially in our early career uh, interventions as part of our offerings we train students not only on how to become good bankers or good it professionals but also on what constitutes a good human being what is the kind of traits that they require to de to demonstrate in the workplace and in life in general so there is a accent on on these courses i wouldn't you know bracket them as a spiritual component uh, because these courses are Uh, specific to a particular industry and there's a lot of heavy content there but we do focus on the overall emotional well-being of the student we bring in industry practitioners uh, to engage with them and to and to build them out so we uh, look at students from a graduate stream we look at students from a pre-graduate stream as well and largely speaking these are students who not been able to make it to the kind of universities that my co-panelists represent uh and there is a challenge when it comes to the confidence there is a challenge when it comes to their capabilities of dealing with the world and therefore that extra input is is invaluable thanks uh, anish so my next question is to dr prabhu there was a question and you know also around are we pushing the students outside the classroom with this technology see if there is a conscious learner and there are resources available across and peop like including peop like people teachers how do we define a classroom is that definition of a classroom with chairs and a board is at all relevant now you know and so how would you define a classroom in today's digital age where a learner is conscious <coughs> has a flexibility to learn certain things on the online mode or in a more asynchronous mode can be in a classroom for a tutorial and a discussion that can happen very much outside the classroom so how do you define classroom in today's context uh basically when uh, uh we go back for all the guru shishya parampara and all over the years that we have seen that we teach in the classroom together the we expect the learning happens together and we evaluate individually but when we go to the corporate or a life so we learn individually and will be evaluated collectively as in a team so this 
we can bring by using a uh, edtech in my opinion what it means is uh, is the technology is uh, smart enough to provide the personalized attention of course there is a lot of ai related sometime it would be very happy in the actual classroom why we think that it is so good because the teacher has an attention to individual as a teacher when i go for me my the natural habitat is the classrooms and if there is a one student if is not in a position to understand and is a good teacher can what is a hear the unheard voices of the student by seeing the question mark in his face and he will start answering those things without he asking and this is the personalized thing because personal things are slowly moving now even in medicine today headache everybody takes the sari down but it does not work for all so similarly now moving is a personalized thing even the car design today he says that okay gk prabhu he is this is the profile is his state and this is the color he wants there's a new car will come i would be very happy so similarly when we go to the edtech for me the classroom is the the technology must understand my psyche and give me what i want and it must understand which i do not understand and it must teach me more on that push me towards many of this kind of a content and i am sure in a larger classroom now today it could be very difficult there are good teachers are they are doing it very well but the technology by understanding this uh, the nature in which we ask the queries the nature in which we see this kind of a content that technology will understand what i want more which is already happening when we start browsing the next time it will say what you have browsed already so maybe for me the classroom is this personalized thank you thank you gk sir excellent point so my next question is uh, to you pavan ji which uh, i think uh, prabhu sir mentioned very clearly the one of the most important stakeholders in the education environment is the teacher right so if you see any industry which has leveraged technology and sort of technology is disrupted whether it is transportation you see today there are uh, you know drivers using technology so beautifully whether it is uber rola or so many other technologies on the other side there is like let's say even food delivery or even we are talking about doctors today you know the we can consult doctors so beautifully and be able to get very effective you know to some of the basic i would say because because doctors have adopted technology you know very very well in terms of how to interact with the patients how to get the data how do we bring a massive transformation in terms of the skill set of our teachers in adopting technology and not just limited to the top 1 or 2 percent of the institutions but actually to at scale because if we have to really leverage technology well then our teachers have to be trained enough and have to be willing enough at scale to adopt technology how do we make that possible and i'm asking this question to you because excel works at that kind of scale and that thinking will obviously come from somebody like you uh thank you i think uh, <clears throat> i would like to bring at least uh, two three points it, it it's it's not only the um, you need to have a scale plus you need to have you need to push this parameter into the teacher to make technology as a tool digital tool to aid the education so what there are two things one is as an industry we have to build the capacity building which has to be in person trainings which has to be make them understand how to use these tools effectively so there can be trainings which has to be organized at the university levels at the physical level so that people can start using it and there has to be new technologies which are coming up very fast so that they can use effectively how i mean some of the teachers have started using chat gpt what we were seeing into into their curriculum effectively to answer the questions of the students so it's it's like technology is moving very fast that is one so industry 
as an government organization we have to play an important role where we have to bring the training programs do these trainings to the teachers second is the enforcement enforcement what i mean is that you need to have some kind of um, what we call is uh, a mandatory uh, thing that okay technology the teachers has to use in their teaching either in in their kras or in terms of whoever the teacher uses effectively either that teacher should be an influencer to other teachers so that is the way it has to be it has to be brought into into the all the teachers because otherwise you can't have a mass movement where the technology can be taken at the ground level so these are the two points where which has to go hand in hand so one is as a uh, you need to give the training you have to impart the training to the teachers on a regular basis on a continuous basis on a large scale basis on top of that the universities has to have some kind of uh, in incentivization or enforcement through the their normal practices that okay these are the teachers who will be promoted or whatever the rules you wanted to make that is what the under the policy domain of the universities which has to be brought it out so that they start learning and themselves and they start practicing themselves as those tools which enable them to have a effective uh tools for their teaching that's the two mod mode i which i foresee which uh, is what i think is is will bring a a mass movement in using these tools effectively and another thing is that i think uh, is what i feel that one of the important uh, in indian uh, scenario is that a student uh, i mean whenever i've seen a student uh, practically how he connects he connects basically with his own mother language mother tongue a mother language and in a basic uh, language which he can understands very well right now the content is available mostly in english there is no local content whether you wanted to connect the spirituality you wanted to connect with this until unless this type of content in india indian geography is not available at the local level it is very difficult to connect the students very well so teachers have to start promoting that so that is what another aspect when they you start using the tools i have seen uh, various students from the higher education i mean you try to explain the same concept uh, in the in the electromagnetic wave or whatever the complex concept they don't understand until unless you make it very localized you make it very practical to that domain that's why the importance of university the physical universities are important the classroom environment is important it cannot go away i mean it's uh, people are saying that okay it will phase out but it will not phase out from my perspective my personal perspective it's because the teachers connects with the student they make them understand and make them at the pace of those uh, students so that is what is important and that is what the teachers training has to be evolved with this type of contents available and it will become a mass movement in the country itself thank you final question uh, to you professor ravi uh, especially around the post graduation and the programs upwards not the under graduation right so and there was also a question around why do we really need students to come to a campus when they can actually learn in a more experiential mode in industry and professor sobik is here and in his you know bits plan is one of the largest leaders in work integrated learning programs right uh, what is your thought especially geo institute is largely focusing on post graduate programs right now and eventually research right how do you see industry immersed learning which is powered by edtech where a lot of content theory is available in the in the technology platforms and you are actually learning in an experiential mode how do you see the future of those programs so uh, thank you hamdan i think the experiential learning is an integral part of you know higher education especially you know, once you have had an undergraduate degree then you have some work experience if you want to go further you know you need to have be able to contribute to new knowledge or otherwise and that is kind of done in a research environment i think that's uh, you know the best done right the other thing is that you know education as we know is a people intensive business so you know you need to have this personal mentoring you know you learn from again this uh, guru shishya parambra kind of thing is even more important at the post graduate level and the other thing which is to be emphasized and you know which you mentioned about geo institute is that it is not only the academics 
you know, who can teach, but also the practitioners. I think that's, you know, becoming more important now the UGC has allowed for the professor of practice. I think the practitioners have to be co-teaching all these classes. I think that's the only way you can upskill, upskill these people. And this upskilling has to continue throughout your life. I mean, it's just not uh, learning for life, which is our motto, but it's lifelong learning. I think for that kind of thing, you know, you have to be in this environment where this co-teaching and co-mentoring is done. Thank you, Professor Ravi. I think we overshot by five minutes, but uh, thank you again to Fiki for this opportunity to, uh, you know, have this conversation with you all. And thank you so much for participating in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, indeed. May I request all our panelists to kindly come together for a group photograph. And ladies and gentlemen, we would request everyone to kindly remain seated. We are straight away moving to the next panel discussion session. I would request you all to give us a few minutes while we arrange the top table.